It's December 19th, 2019, and you're listening to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard or seen for again, 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 again. Remember this is what we wanted. Remember this is what we said. To never be heard or seen for again, 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 again. Hello, and welcome to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. I am your host, Chris Quinn, coming to you one last time in 2019 from the Co-op Prosperity Sphere Studio B to be exact, because there's festivities going on in Studio A, some sort of, I think it's a lumpen party, I believe, it's, which <coughs> probably ignored an invite to or something, but... Is it Surge? Is it a lumpen party? It's not? Okay, good. good. Okay. Um, Edmore's out there, though, and he's uh, he's making making merry out there, so maybe we'll see uh, him in a little bit, or, or at least hear him through the somewhat soundproof room that we're in. Um, sometimes his voice has a way of piercing through most, uh, you know, otherwise soundproof things. But nonetheless, thanks for lumpen. Thanks to Lumpen for having us on yet again, and thanks to the fearless leaders of Lumpen Radio, Mr. Logan Bay and Jamie Trecker, and uh, thanks to producer Serge for uh, coming back from California just to uh, work on this show for free again. So, you know, that's uh, if that gives you an idea of... uh, how momentous, momentous this show is and, and how important it is in people's lives. So I want to thank him as well. It's the least uh, least I could do. And thanks to all you guys out there listening, whether it's over the airwaves on 105.5 FM or if it's via podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts these days. Where do you get your podcasts these days, Nate? Stitcher. Stitcher. There you go. So you're the one person that I see who gets it from Stitcher. Okay, yeah. good, good. Now I know. I'll wave to you maybe or whatever they do, like or... <laughs> Um, sure. Yeah. Cool. And uh, yeah. So thanks everyone out there. If you uh, if your your podcast source of choice allows for ratings and reviews, they're always very appreciated. So if you guys could do that, I would uh, very much like that and, and appreciate it. So for those listening for the first time, well, this is a little bit different show. This is the a year end show. This is the the fourth year end show that I've that I've done. So gives you an idea of how how long this darn little podcast has been going on. <clears throat> uh quite a while. But anyway, I just try to get some people sitting around a table and people who have made beer a part of their lives and uh just kind of get get them talking, you know, kind of like we're sitting around drinking beer and, and talking, which is exactly what we are doing. So we're going to get right into it. Uh, a little bit different of a format, like I said, to to normal shows, but it should be fun. Got a stacked uh, stacked guest list, and I'm, I'm going to start introducing them right now in order of seniority, that being how many times they've been on the show. And uh, the beer cruncher, the beer aficionado, is uh, is the senior member today. That is Doug Velicki. How are you? Doing great. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. This is your second year-end show? Yeah, I was thinking, like, you know, quarterbacks, uh, they don't count how many wins they have. They count how many Super Bowls they've won. I I don't count how many times I come on the show, but how many year-end shows I get invited to. So There you are. This is now ring number two. (laughs) Sweet. Nice. Well done. Yes. Um, Well, thanks, and uh, and congratulations. I guess we're in order. (laughs) Thank you. Um, my next guest is Mr. Brian Roth of Good Beer Hunting. You out there, Brian? Yeah, uh, coming for Doug's throne, apparently. Yeah. The All up right. and comer. Yeah. On my first year end show. Thank you very much for having me. Yes. You're you're welcome. Um 
yeah, I uh, I tried to get somebody who uh, would have had their second, but they declined. So <laughs> <laughs> happy to be the alternate. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't say you were the alternate, <laughs> but uh, but maybe you were. Uh, what's new with you, man? Oh, just uh, well excited to to ramp things down actually uh, for the year. Um, this next week's going to give me some good time to finally get caught up on writing. Um, I was just in Ireland a couple of weeks ago, which was for relaxing, but uh, for it would uh, it I couldn't avoid beer mm-hmm. um, at that point. Spent some spent some time at Guinness, visited with the folks at Boundary up in Belfast, which was a lot of fun. Um, had some very good um, American style beers, uh, in Dublin, which was mm. uh, really impressive and a lot of fun. Whiplash. They had a New England IPA, which is about as close, I think, to a, a fresh American version as I've had abroad. Okay. Yeah. I've noticed that with the, uh, the juicy hazies and stuff, they're starting to get pretty, pretty American, um, out there. And they're, we were talking about a little bit last week that, they haven't yet kind of uh, started to experiment and, and kind of make their own styles from that in most cases. We we're talking about how the kernel is an exception to that. But um, but anyway, um, cool. Yeah, when I was in, in Ireland last, uh, there was really no – there was no craft beer, N- none that I came across. But that was okay. I didn't really need craft beer there. Awesome, awesome pub culture though. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for uh, – picking up ring number one it's in the mail so uh you'll be expecting it you know you should be expecting it anytime anytime now if you don't see it just uh reach out to nate he'll 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 fill you in on on what to do speaking of which mr nate nelson chris you're the senior most member of the panel if it goes by who was on first oh yeah because you were on like the first one of the first five well i'm I'm happy to finally be on a year-end show last show of the decade chris Oh man! Let's I didn't not even forget. Think about that, man. You would—that's worth two rings. You would have brought a whole new group of people in if you mm-hmm. had you known it was going to be this auspicious. Well, don't. Yes. <laughs> well, yes, of course. Yes, but let's not. I would. But let's not talk about it. Yeah, no. But you're, but you're here, so let's I make the most here. of it. Yeah. You're doing well. I am doing well. Good. Good. You brought some nice. Uh, I did. Some goos. I did. And speaking of goos, mm-hmm. uh, Chris, congratulations on being added to the network of fine bars by Dreyfontainen. Thank you. One of 50. Thank you. Yeah, they expanded it to, uh, the, to the States. To the United States, yeah. So earlier this year, they had a list of bars in Asia and Europe, and uh, they just this week announced the list of U.S. bars that are going to be seeing some kind of fancy specialties from Tree Fontaine. Yeah, mm-hmm. should be coming early next year. So really? that was something that we found out several months ago, and we kept it kept it under wraps, yeah. mainly because we didn't want to say anything wrong and, and blow it. Mm-hmm. And, and, mm-hmm. and anger people. So, um, yeah, so that should be really exciting to get some. Uh, this has been a good year in Chicago for exports coming back in. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it's, I hope that it'll, it'll get even better. <coughs> um, on an unrelated note, Mr. <laughs> Brian Kirby of uh, Heartland Beverage Distribution. No. No. It's okay. Heartland <clears throat> Distribution Company. We'll just call it Heartland Beverage. Heartland Beverage. Heartland Beverage. How are you? I'm well. It's good to be back. It's been a while, man. Yes, it has. What have been up to? Selling beer? More of the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, just, yes, mm-hmm. it's more of everything. More suppliers, more trucks, more sales reps, more accounts. But good. that's what we want, right? It's all, it's all moving in the right direction. Slow and steady. That's what I nice. want for you. I want more of that. Yep. That's good. Um... That's great to hear. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear it. And and thanks for being able to uh, kind of break away and and do the show. I know you've been been busy on multiple fronts. So no problem. You were specifically requested. I won't say who, um, but it was Doug. <laughs> so yeah. So anyway, thanks for for coming on. You bet. That means everyone else was not specifically requested by Doug. So hmm. there you go. Guys, three rings. Doug, Doug doesn't no like hard you guys. Feelings, Doug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're gonna kind of do things a little different. Like I said, we're not gonna talk about beers that we've had <laughs> lately. Instead, we're gonna we're gonna talk uh, first about um, what we think the beers of the year were, and then you know some stories of the year, maybe some predictions, <clears throat> maybe relive a little bit of past predictions, stuff like that. Mm. So, mm. 
Um, just want to kick it off. Beer of the year. Does anyone have a, a a slam dunk beer of the year? We were talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, Doug was mentioning that it, it wasn't super easy for him to to pick, and I will say, having done this now four times, by far the hardest beer of the year for me to pick was this year. Usually, I. I you know I I think about it for a little bit and and maybe I change my mind but this one I was really just I don't know it was so it was so tough. what 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 goes into your thought process in choosing the beer of the year because I a very good question because you can take it from another excellent a, question a bunch of different angles uh, is it the most uh, newsworthy noteworthy beer was it your favorite beer right it could be it was could, it your least favorite I'll beer? say this I leave it um, pretty general for exactly that reason because i think i want it to be whatever that means for for you so it can be for completely different reasons we're not all you know uh, rating our favorite beers or uh, or sorry the beer of the year on the same scale mm-hmm. so you know we're, this isn't a competition we're all winners here is what i'm what i'm trying to say um but one thing i i was talking to the guys at the shop about, you know, the beer of the year. And I usually get everybody in the, in the bar slash stores input and just kind of feel them out. And, and we were kind of, of the mind that, you know, some of these in the, in the past, some beers that kind of took us by surprise and like just started moving crazy volume or beers that, uh, which is one of the things that we would, go by um kind of something that we we took note of um didn't really happen this year in part because the seasonal schedule is so amplified now that that stuff is just like here and gone here and gone here and gone and that's kind of how seasonals seem to be now they're not even really seasonals very often they're limited yeah they're just like drops like bang 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 so yeah so that was maybe one reason that we didn't see a beer of kind of of that ilk as the as the beer of the year one year we did cuvee renee Mm -hmm. um creek sorry cuvee renee creek yeah when that came to the market yeah that was when we were super dry for to target yeah yeah when it came to target Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for for really quality uh it was just amazing to have a world-class Lambic, uh, Creek Lambic just just can be there all the time. Just out in the open, right? Isn't that? It's funny to remember when that was was hard to to come by. Yeah, yeah, at a good price and everything. Simpler times. Mm-hmm. But this year, well, who who wants to go first? I'll go first. Go first. All right. Um, for mine, I was like trying to think of something that um, would set off a chain reaction, meaning it was like kind of the the first um, or or maybe the beginning of a new wave and with with beer you know there's so many you know we'll talk about this later in the show so much of that is outside of beer it seems like right now all the new uh the new the new categories the new types of drinks that breweries are starting to focus on but the only one i could think of that's like the beginning is uh heineken 0.0 so the timing of that was like January 2019. It was the perfect beginning. They decided they were going to be the ones to push this. And, uh, you know, I've kind of questioned whether it was there was a demand for it, but they are pushing it and they're kind of creating the demand and, uh, you know, causing people to consider it. And it's, you know, maybe not working out as, you know, it's it's not a rocket ship right now, but it is a, it's no a big brand. And, it's, and yeah. they're, I just saw a, a press release uh, mm. a few days ago that they've they're expanding it they've created a 31 pack to uh, launch for dry january to get people to drink one heineken zero zero a month and at first i was like a day yeah yeah i was like or, sorry a day for the month and i was like you know it, it's well branded and i was like well what's this going to do once <laughs> january 15th comes around is anyone going to buy this but i mean it, it can really work for any month almost any month you know yeah um so and they're I, giving away for free I didn't see that. They're doing they're doing a giveaway where you can sign up and get a, a free pack for the month of January. Wow, and they can because it's not alcohol. Oh yeah, yeah. all the rules get oh, thrown out the window and there's no 0. alcohol involved. Zero. Yep. Yes. So, so it's no secret that 
like a lot of breweries are going to, or, or already are or are in the process of uh, figuring out uh, non-alcoholic beer. Uh, it's very tricky to, to pull off and taste good. Tastes like something else uh, that you brew with alcohol in it. Very difficult, very expensive. But um, I think they started it, and I think it's going to explode and not stop ever. Like, I think it's ever. just going to keep going up, well, at least for, like, yeah. A month yeah, really, really ever. I do. <laughs> Through January 31st. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, uh, so I'm, I'm a big believer in this, um, that, uh, it's just going to grow and grow indefinitely. And they're kind of the ones putting all the marketing dollars into it, creating the awareness, the thought that, oh yeah, I can have a beer and it not be, have alcohol in it. Mm. Um, favorite beer of duels. Yep. <laughs> Bears, hawks, <laughs> yeah. socks, bulls. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I mean, that's a bold prediction. The first, the beer of the year being not a beer, uh, or I mean, kind of a beer, right? I mean, that may not be the may not be the last. Not really. Yeah. <laughs> kind of not a beer. Mm-hmm. Kind of a beer. <laughs> so it's it's really fluid. Is non-alcoholic beer beer? I mean, uh, it is for for this show and for this beer of the year thing. It absolutely is, but it's not right. It's not beer. What is, is objective? Beer. Truth, it is Chris. beer. Yeah. Why not? Well, uh, isn't beer alcoholic by definition? I don't know. I mean, what's non-alcoholic wine? It's grape juice, right? Would know. it depend on how you that go about it? Because right. you can make beer and then vacuum the alcohol out. So are you saying it becomes not beer when you just because you vacuum? I think I've always defined yeah. beer by its ingredients, not by the alcohol content. Yeah. Okay. I can think of it as well, beer. I mean, you can consider it as a, as a product of a fermentation process. Sure. And if there's no alcohol there, there's still fermentation products. So is Malta Goya beer? Yeah, but that was not fermented. It, it is it is malt syrup soda. Okay. I think with some malt hops barley. in some in some cases. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So it's not fermented in any way. But the ingredients. It's awfully close. It's We're missing by that, ingredients. Missing that magic touch. Hmm. We need Ashley Brand here, just to be like, ah, legally, it's got to be alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if you disagree, I'll sue you. Um, which is definitely how Ashley talks, if you've ever talked to him. <laughs> Threatens to sue you at least once every other sentence. Um, okay. How about you, Nate? What's your beer of the year? Uh, Chris, I, I was feeling really cynical this week, so it was mostly hey, mostly hater picks. So, uh, Welcome to just, the club. Just, just really quickly, I got two runners. Hater picks. Two runners yeah, up. Man. Go. Uh, Natural Light, Natter Days. Mm. Oh, no. I had, I had to add to my short list. Uh Second runner up, uh, Weldworks Wholesome, the coffee oh, style boy. brewed with real whole milk. Three hundred gallons of milk. <sighs> okay, so so my so is, if beer is if if you define beer by the ingredients, is wholesome <laughs> beer? I think this is a losing battle to define it by the ingredients because yeah. especially in today's day and age. All right, so so my my real pick is. Bourbon County brand stout. Okay. Because I think this is the year that broke Bourbon County's back. Okay. And, you know, I bring up Bourbon County, but I could also put I thought in about using that. Founders, KBS, CBS, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know, Surly Darkness. Darkness, totally. Perennial Abraxas, all of these, uh, yes. you know, blockbuster, big beer releases. Mm-hmm. I think the, the the wind's falling out of the sails. Mm-hmm. S-A-I-L-S. <laughs> and maybe also the other one. <laughs> yes. Very, very. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to give too much credence to all the curmudgeon that say, oh, the next the next big thing in beer is something really drinkable, like a Kolsch. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think people are realizing they don't like Imperial Stouts as much as, as they believed they did a couple of years ago. Well, and everyone you named has one thing in common. Do you know what that is? Why don't you tell me? None of them uh, evolved the size, the format. <sighs> They're all... Big format. They're all, yeah, they're all. Large they all format. could have come down in size, and they didn't. So that's that is an element. Hmm. There you go. Well, uh, then again, you know there are examples of you know, well, actually, ones like Rev. Who... Te- technically, Bourbon County went up in size. Mm-hmm. But that was a while ago. Yeah, yeah. That was a while ago. But yeah. it, it it really seems to me like 2013, 2014 was a high water mark in interest. In Bourbon County and is continuously falling. And from all the all the things I'm hearing about what they want to do in the future, it sounds like uh, what are you hearing? They want to do in the future. Well, they. Well, it sounds like what what I've heard is that they don't want to make adjunct variants of Bourbon County. They want to go to 
uh, you know, single barrel models. And that would be great if this was 2006 and uh, 5050 hadn't been doing that for over a decade. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the Eclipse Stout. Yeah. That Mm -hmm. is uh, probably gathering dust on a shelf somewhere near you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, it's it's interesting. It's it's very interesting to see stuff like that. Yeah. Sir. uh, Darkness. We got at the shop. We got caught. Mm. Um, and, and it was like immediate last year, boom, gone this yeah. year, boom, not gone. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. Not and, gone. you know, same with, I mean, there's, Great so, beer. there's so many beers you could, you could say that about, but they're almost all Imperial stouts. Uh, yeah. What, what, I mean, the, it's, the product is just as good, if not better. Mm-hmm. So what it's good. It? Yeah. Well, there you go. We've got a cynical, a cynical <laughs> beer of the year. I love it. <laughs> Brian, I heard you uh, Love to hate. cry out at at one of the the potential one of the runners up for for beer of the year. You want to go next? What's your what's your beer of the year? Oh, I was legit going to say Natter Days. All right, yes, go for it. <laughs> well, it, Why? I'll, I'll I'll give that in one that I think I was also really impressed with. Natter Days, in terms of its sales volume for 2019, is going to be a top 20 equivalent for a craft brewery. It sells as much as Sweetwater's portfolio mm-hmm. in IRI stores, uh, which is ridiculous, even if it may have been created on the goof. Um, that the, the, the following that it created uh, was huge. Uh, mm-hmm. And I get there's a lot of marketing and backing behind it for distribution, but you don't sell something like 260,000 barrels worth of a beer if people didn't enjoy it to some degree. Oh, yeah. Um, so why I, do you I think, think people did? Really why do you think it, it, it <clears throat> took hold so well? You know, it, I think the connection, obviously, to what, how people may drink or consume um, the regular natty itself, natty, natty light, ice. Yeah. I think that app that helps um, for sure. But I, I don't know. It's the the flavor. Be, I've had it a couple times. It is perfect for the summer situation of light drinking. You don't want to think about it. It's pretty sweet. Not for my palate, but easy to move in terms of those. You know what I think it was. The twelve packs, thirty racks, twenty four racks. Don't forget um, the seventy seven pack tote. The seventy seven. It just, I, I think it just eclipsed <laughs> a lot of important things that we saw this year. Um, flavors being one of them, flavored beers in particular. Um, it, the, I, I do say that seriously, maybe with like a little bit tongue in cheek. One other beer, just to sneak it in, that I, I think I've been super impressed with with what happened to it this year was um, the Voodoo Ranger Imperial IPA. Um, hmm. That brand is going to grow something like. 40 ish percent in IRI this year. Um, and that is a 9% double IPA uh, that retails like around $11. It's hitting on all the things that consumers are looking at and that we've seen is selling. It's a higher ABV product, it's a reasonable price. Um, and for a brewery that has had some troubles in recent years, that's a really big win for them. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I had no idea that it was uh, up so big. And for a 9% double IPA, that's uh, it's interesting. There's so many people saying that the trends are going one way. And then you have all these examples of things succeeding in, in another way. It just, guys, I guess, goes to show how diverse craft beer is at this point. Um, I mean, people talking about drinkability and craft uh, um you know how drinkability and low alcohol is is really kind of key and you have the seltzers that are often like bone bone dry but then you know you're talking about natter days which is completely sweet and that was also you know a huge hit and and people loved it so it's i think people just i don't know it's i don't i i think it's it's complicated because probably a lot of the people who are drinking White Claw were probably also drinking Natter Days, I would think. So they're drinking, you know, some sweet, some bone dry, all fruity. Yeah, Maybe people just like fruity. It's at least at the same party. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's at least at the same party. Yes. Yes, exactly. I, I picture White Claw more as the, like, <laughs> 30-year-olds and up, and Natter Days is the, like, 20 29 and down. Okay. But, 29 and down. Hmm. All right. 
I'm not saying there's no crossover. Of course, there's plenty of. That's just how I've yeah. Kind of see it. It's more a lot of young people, little price driven to I mean, crush. Uh, I think you're right. Nowadays is probably younger. That I'll definitely. Well, I think Seltzer might be broader, but I think maybe Seltzer is also younger. I don't mm-hmm. know the people who drink it at our bar. We do have a Seltzer option yeah. there. Tend to be younger people. They they tend to drink the seltzers so and you know people who just do not like craft beer Mm -hmm. they also will you know sometimes just pick up a a a white call where before they'd probably get a a cider or a or a mixed drink or something like that so i just know on the uh the birthday party circuit uh ever it's white claw in every cooler the kid the kid birthday yeah kids love my, my friends don't really have birthday parties anymore but um yeah, the kid birthday parties, it's always White Claw. I've never seen that or days anywhere I've known, unfortunately. I've never had it. I just see them on Chug videos on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Yeah, that's pretty much it um, as well. I've seen them at bars. Uh, I've, I've seen them at pretty crappy bars. That's where I've seen it and probably where there's just a lot of, uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to look into it more than that. That's just where I've seen it in cans. But um, I've never had one. I've never seen it on the... You know, the beer cooler circuit party thing. I haven't seen a ton of, uh, maybe I just don't go to a lot of them because I don't think I've seen a lot of <laughs> seltzer either. Mm-hmm. Or uh, probably what it is is whenever I go, I'm expected to be the one to bring all the beer. So I kind of control it. And uh, by my by my count, everybody uh, is really into beers that I like. So <laughs> based on that, <laughs> uh, I'll go next because I don't want it to be a total letdown if I go last. I don't want this to end on a on a <laughs> low note. Mine's pretty, I don't know. Mine, I was really trying to figure out what it was. It was going to almost be a, a cynical a one. Hate, a hater pick? But I, it wasn't a hater pick. It was more just like, wow, I was surprised at how this just, this certain beer fell flat, but I didn't want to go there on the last... Oh, for the beer of the year being a negative thing. Mm -hmm. So um, the beer that surprised us most in sales this year, which is what I just decided to go off of because I didn't really have, you know, a beer that, you know, like when Anderson Valley goes, I came out and I was like, oh, my gosh, this stuff is this flavor is going to, you know, do very, very well. I didn't really have that this year. Um But we went from probably two cases of Sierra Nevada Celebration last year to, um, we could easily do 25 cases this year, which, you know, for a, you know, quote unquote seasonal or not a year round beer, I mean, that the only beer, beer that could compete with that for us this year would be like something from a hop butcher or something like that. Um, so it's um and, and I'm very confused by it. I'm not exactly sure why it has done so well. Um I think it's just struck a chord with people. We certainly haven't been really promoting it uh especially. Um you know, we just brought in a couple c- cases and they were just gone. So we started thinking about it and perhaps we think it could be that you know, there's a a younger guy named uh uh, J Max, who works at the shop, and we asked him what why he liked it, and he said, "I don't want to drink milkshakes anymore. I'm I'm so over it, and so many of these other beers, I can't trust the if they're going to be fresh or not. But a seasonal, that is a fresh hop seasonal. I see that it's fresh hop. I know that it's for the season, so it has to be fresh, and I know that it's not a hazy." you know, a juicy hazy. So I reach for it because I can kind of trust it. And I know that it's going to be in this more kind of not hazy profile. And I said, Hey, that's a, it could be, I mean, your reasoning could be a lot of people's reasoning. Um, it also would help to, uh, legitimize my prediction on the beer crunchers blog last year that people would start looking for, for non, Juicy hazy IPAs uh, towards the end of the year. Don't know if it's happened quite yet abroad, 
Doug and I go back and forth on this, but since he actually has data and I don't, mm -hmm. I kind of have to say that he's right, even though I know he's wrong, but I just can't prove it. And opposite of that, he to... can prove I'm wrong, but that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that's that's mine. <laughs> uh, kind of a weird one. A not at all new beer, but... Um, legacy. It's a legacy. A legacy beer and a very old um, kind of classic flavor profile. But hey, it's resonating with, with some people. Um, and for whatever reason, it's, it's up huge for us. So you think um, people are putting down their milkshake IPA and grabbing Sierra Celebration? Or do you think people that just drank a five Milk seven years might be extreme but yeah. five seven years ago or just like that is a good beer i want to make sure i grab some this year and it's just i see it everywhere and anytime i go on twitter <laughs> during the season or wherever i just see more people than ever like kind of you know pun intended celebrating it and saying like man this is just spot on and something like that And i've just been seeing an uptick in people talking about it mm -hmm. and i wonder if there's just some like organic word of mouth going on of like rediscovering it and that's what's happening but i see it as people a lot more of probably people that had it a long time ago, then I believe that there's these young people chasing uh, double dry hop beers or quickly shifting to that. I would doubt that. Not that I can prove yeah. that in any way. That that would surprise me. I mean, it might be people who are old enough to have had it, you know, back in the day, mm -hmm. but have also been drinking kind of more uh, modern flavor profile yeah. IPAs and want to get back to it. Yeah, I could see that. Um, that's kind of anecdotally the the people who I've heard talk about it, and I and I have heard people who are probably in their early thirties is kind of the people I've seen kind of grabbing it and um, and and also just commenting on how how much they like it. So yeah, one thing on that on that beer for here in North Carolina, at least, and I know this is going to be different everywhere, is that uh, I've I've picked up a twelve pack. Uh, I've had a couple of friends mentioning it too because it's been on sale for probably about almost a almost a month, probably since it's debuted here. Mm -hmm. You can get a twelve pack here in uh, Durham, North Carolina, depending on the week. It's been hovering between thirteen to fifteen dollars, uh, and especially for that beer, you know, I know I'm happy to pick it up, uh, and I I imagine that that's uh, an incentive for people who may not even be terribly familiar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another beer we considered uh, having it be the beer of the year was um, the uh, Beechwood Amalgamator that mm. we put on uh, and also had in in cases um, which people were going absolutely bananas for. I mean, they'd have one at the at the bar and immediately go in and, and take a four pack home because that was a beer that. I don't know if we had a, a, another one that really tasted like that. And people, um, at least it, it, it's my experience. If anyone out there is, uh, you know, tries to to get their breweries to to make new beers or set the schedules, there's at least some people who are ready to try some different stuff. And putting out one seasonal West Coast IPA, it, it's not going to be as good as somebody who has perfected theirs for years and years. So you might want to do a couple batches of it. Um, so Keep it in the tap room for yeah. a while. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that was going to be another one that uh, – but it was weird because that was like a drop and who knows, you know, how it would have done if it kind of stuck around for a while. But How about you, Brian? What's uh... – Yeah, so I started thinking about, <clears throat> you know, what's – nationally or the beer that affected the most people and then realized there's a bunch of different directions you can go with that so i started taking the more selfish route mm -hmm. and thought about what was the most important beer to me yes. this year and so i landed instantly on pollyanna brewing company's light reading which took gold at the gabf this year and it's not that it's it's like a, a shameless plug or anything it was more so about you know, that Saturday afternoon, I'm in my garage, you know, doing handy stuff around the house and still kind of listening in the background and um, just being able to hear one of the breweries that, you know, you've been fighting fighting a good fight with. Um, you know, we're a small distribution company. We've got small breweries, and, you know, we, we put a lot of hours in, and then 
uh, to be able to get kind of national recognition like that from time to time, you know, even like on, a, on an American logger or whatever it ends up being. You know, we have that 20, 30 minutes where we're, we're sending texts back and forth, and it just kind of um, helps kind of solidify the reason why we're doing what we're doing, um, even though we may not have that beer in the tanks and it's ready to rock and roll and all that good stuff. It's just knowing that, hey, we're, on, we're doing the right things. You know, keep doing what you're doing. Um, have a nice affirmation. Yes, that's the word that I think I've been trying to find the last couple of days. But, <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, it was important to us. You know, we, you know, we got a good kick out of it and uh, plan on making a lot more of it next year. But um, yeah, that's it. Cool. Um, well, I was just uh, interrupted. I was about to say something before Serge interrupted me to mention that we need to take an underwriting break. So what do you know? Perfect timing. Why don't we uh, take 60, 90 seconds, listen to some underwriting, and then we'll come back with more of the year-end show from the Beer Temple. Welcome back to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable. I'm your host, Chris Quinn. I'm joined by Brian Roth, Doug Velicki, Nate Nelson, and Brian Kirby. And we were just talking about our beers of the year, but now we're going to talk about our beer stories of the year. What was the, the thing of... Of the year, Nate, I'm looking at you. <laughs> what was the biggest thing for, that happened in beer oh, oh, to you this year, for, or not for you, but what did you choose? I I, I chose uh, uh, Rasnarok or uh, the, mm-hmm. the the mm-hmm. the great zuckening. Uh, so uh, <laughs> earlier this year, Facebook uh, announced that it was going to be addressing the issue of of uh, Youth vaping, uh, in light of uh, the you know the various deaths and and the increase in, in nicotine use by kids, so they were going to remove all uh, all Facebook groups that dealt with the, uh, the 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 sale, purchase, or trade of nicotine and alcohol products, which means that the beer trading community, which uh, was existing at that point in. The majority on Facebook, uh, those those groups are still steadily being deleted. Mm-hmm. So as of as of uh, I think two weeks ago, the largest group in Chicago was wiped out. Yes, and uh, <clears throat> we had some discussions on this show about how we thought. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. Now I'm now I can't talk. But how I'm emotional too, Chris. Yeah, how <laughs> this might affect. Uh, aftermarket sales and stuff like that and i was was on an island here by saying that it was going to you know cut the the floor out from a pull the the rug out whatever euphemism i'm trying to say but butchering and i was roundly rejected i I remember tom quarter was on here and said i was crazy but guess what tom i was right (laughs) i was right meaning you were wrong more importantly yeah i'd rather someone else really yeah Ideally, you'd like to be able to tell someone they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So I don't know if we uh, – I had uh, Dan uh, Pichet uh, do, do a little Pichet. write-up on uh, – Subject matter expert. Subject matter expert. Oh, yeah. So do you want to – can I read please, please. his comments on please. Rasnarok and its effect? He said, the recent moves by Facebook to shut down beer trading, selling, and razzling groups uh, have an imp- will have an impact yet to be fully realized. While it's true that a good amount of transactions will move to other venues, the casual, casual buyer is less likely to move, and thus demand is going to fall without their per, uh, participation. Partici- yes, thank you. Participation. Um, there is a phenomenon known as the wealth effect. It measures changes in spending habits and accompanying changes in perceived wealth. For example, in the stock market, if the stock market is doing well and the economy is strong, the consumers would be more likely to spend money on uh, money on new, um, like spend money uh, for their new home. I think is what he meant to say. The same applies to craft beer. If an individual believed their bottle collection to have a tangible value due to their ability to sell that bottle at any time, they might be more likely to spend on their, quote, hobby and participate in the secondary market. What happens when they can't sell their bottles as easily? Even when they do, what happens when the price falls below what they thought it would be worth? Will they continue to purchase at the same pace? It's impossible to kill the secondary market if demand 
for the product is high enough, but face group groups have hosted much of the secondary market for the past five years. Given their uh, permanence, it will thus uh, this will be more a more severe impact um, than we've experienced to date. But wait, hasn't this all happened before? Correct. This is not the first time groups have been closed down. It is, however, the first time closures have happened in advance of investigations and call for more regulation of the platform. With Facebook facing congressional investigations over consumer data concerns, it makes sense that they're cleaning house in advance of that fight. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Subject subject matter expert on secondary market and yeah. also um, just markets in, in yeah, general. Yeah, no, that, that, was, that, was, that was a great reading of, of the implications. Uh, certainly the fact that, one, uh, you know, they're – there was no kind of moralization on exchanging cash for goods, which is a big no-no in the the, the remaining web forums, Beer Advocate Rate Beer. Uh, there was also the case for the Beer Trade subreddit before that was deleted three years ago. Mm-hmm. But yeah, to you know, I think the big thing too is the, the casuals. You know, that's that was the that was the strength of Facebook. <laughs> Everyone was on Facebook, so you don't you know the barrier to entry is so low. You're already there. But, uh, you know, what are the greater implications? You know, we talked a lot about uh, Treehouse in the past where their distribution model is basically the secondary market. Yeah. What, how is this going to impact breweries like that? And and even more so, the the smaller breweries like, I don't know, uh, The Answer in Virginia and so many other little, uh, you know, hype breweries that are really their <laughs> their their model is largely based on people seeing it. Seeing their product on Instagram and then wanting to get it through someone that can go to their physical location and buy it on premise, mm-hmm. and then being able to find have a marketplace to find those beers Absolutely. easily. Absolutely, yeah. So that was your story of the year, and and what do you think uh, the impact of that will be in in the coming year? <sighs> Remains to be seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we may never fully understand the impact of Rasnarok. Okay. Wow. So seismic. Seismic, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or maybe nothing. Who's to say? <laughs> I think those breweries find a uh, distributor, and they'll probably sell a lot more beer that way at cheaper prices to the market. Hmm. Just a thought. Nice, uh, even-handed, unbiased. <laughs> uh, yeah. Unbiased uh, <laughs> advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just coughed. I didn't even say anything. No. Um, I couldn't think of anything clever. Interesting. Rasnarok, story of the year. All right. How about you? Uh, who wants to go next? I'll um, jump in because uh, I'd actually love to uh, to tee up Doug because I think that <laughs> what my interest is uh, goes in well with what, what he'll be talking about. Um, my my big story of this year relates to some of the, the larger – craft breweries in the country and the team ups that have been taking place over the course of this year. Um, the most recent one was with new Belgium when it was purchased by, by Kieran. Um, one of the things that I think was not as talked about as much was that, uh, Kim Jordan openly talked about new Belgium being the first of a collection of breweries that will be purchased with New Belgium kind of being the anchor in the U.S. Um, and we've seen that uh, with kind of is CBA established that now owned by AB Bev. Um, and uh, Canarchy, which is a collection of breweries around the country anchored by Oscar Blues, has kind of leaned in a little bit more into using Canarchy branding uh, alongside and in some cases very uh, openly uh, for a variety of whether it's um, at events or mixed packs with you know Oscar Blue, Cigar City, uh, Deep Ellum breweries in that network as well. Um, and these are all large breweries that are kind of getting squeezed from below, have had hard times growing, and we see a lot of these more tenured companies teaming up as a way to um, – help secure their future. Uh, Boston Beer and Dogfish Head, ex- as example. Um, and I, I think the the change that we're going to see with Miller Coors turning to Molson Coors Beverage Company um, is a part of that, too. 
where it's seeing opportunities not just within its own beers, but in a variety of beverage alcohol space. Kind of really this thematic idea of the di- diversification, whether it's you know teaming up with other breweries to gain insight, expertise, access to market, or simply just an ability to uh, better create and release uh, products that aren't beer, uh, which is becoming increasingly mm-hmm. important for a variety of companies. Um, and just to be clear, so you're saying that uh, craft breweries will team up with other breweries in order to gain insight into how to make you know, non-beer products. Yeah, I, I think there's a there are a lot of benefits. Um, you know, in a case where like Nin- Ninkasi partnering with a real estate firm and private equity to create uh, legacy breweries, you know, their plan is to buy I think it's 15 breweries in the U.S. and they did that. They started that. Um, it was uh, Laurel Wood and Aspen. Um, it, this fall that they purchased or, you know, in the case with, um, with new Belgium, you know, that being a part of whatever becomes the Kieran network, you know, new Belgium already has, uh, kind of deep roots in terms of distribution relationships to national brand. Um, and so the way that I see it for a lot of these larger scale companies, whether it's, you know, artisanal ventures with uh, six point um, and a victory in the collection there with Southern Tier, uh, a lot of these breweries that have kind of gotten to this problem state where, you know, they're maybe not uh, the, the biggest of the big, but they're certainly large regional or smaller national brands. Um, that are having difficulty either kind of managing their distribution. Dogfish had for years. It was a case both of volume, but also just a matter of being able to have a kind of network to send their beers around the country, which they now get with Boston Beer. Uh, and these are kind of simple or pro- uh, answers to these problems that they're now facing in terms of you know challenges with smaller breweries and and people buying products that just aren't beer. Yeah, uh, it is certainly. Yeah, consolidation, and uh, um, I, I think that's what you mean by team ups. It sounds like is is consolidations and mini borging, mini borging, the voltronification yeah, and, of the industry. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think a lot of them they always kind of talk about this in two in terms of the ability to you know it could be ingredients, better access to ingredients, or lower prices. Um, kind of sharing these networks, I think, just keeps on coming up again and again. Uh, and sure, which is the reason ne- why it's necessary. Yeah, why all industries um, kind of consolidate. It's the same reasons. It's for it's it's advantageous to have some of these economies of of scale. Being um, bigger brings leverage. Bigger, better, faster. I think Kanye yeah. said that. Yeah, but I mean, and it's happening pretty rapidly here in. Uh, in, in craft beer. I mean, it's gone to zero to a hundred pretty darn, pretty darn fast. Um, I mean, just in the lifespan of this show, it's pretty much all wild, all happened. Yeah. I'm putting in orders right now. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, interesting. So that was just a T te- that was really, I mean, it was a story of the year, but it was really just a tee up for the, for another story <coughs> of the year, apparently, according to, to Brian. Which was for your story of the year, Doug. But what do you got? Well, Brian started it uh, talking about it already. He started but it's it. The, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to talk about what what I, I like to call a, a little cynically, but um, is the uh, identity, the beginning of the identity crisis that craft breweries are facing with oh, yeah. with the temptation to uh, make all of these uh, beer alternatives, uh, alcohol alternatives, all of the above from the coffees, the kombuchas, the seltzers, alcoholic, non-alcoholic, you name it. These breweries with tank tank availability, maybe not the ideal equipment to make these, but equipment that can make them, the teams that they want to keep utilized. Um, I think there's a, a lot of there's a lot of breweries out there already who've already jumped jumped over and are now launching lines of you know all of the above that I just named. Haven't even mentioned uh, the CBD space, the um, upcoming TH- THC uh, area, similar to CBD, um, which is already going in California but uh, and starting to come here to Illinois. But um, it, it's, it's begun, and it's going to be massive in 2020, where um, you're going to see, you know, 
breweries sticking to their guns, and then you're going to see breweries completely um, cutting their, dividing their business in half and saying we're going to be half a brewery and half all of these other things. Diverse company. And, um, yeah. Uh, so, like, the, the big news of Miller uh, uh, Molson Coors, like, declaring themselves a beverage company, we kind of saw that with Canarchy when they announced uh, Wild Basin, and they kind of started using that term that we're a beverage company now. Um, I think we're going to see a lot, all of a sudden, see all these small breweries starting to say that, which is just going to be a little weird and take a little bit to get used to. Again, it, it's kind of like a, it's not a prediction because it's already happening. So that's why I'm calling it my 2019 story. It's like the beginning of the transition of, uh, you know, I don't know what percent, 10 percent, 20 percent of our breweries into beverage companies of, of some sort. OK, so it's 10 to 20. It's a lot. Yeah. So you're saying, um, you know, probably 700 to 1500 uh beverage companies in the united states in the coming how long year one yeah, year in one year whoa yeah. bold now now, now now keep in mind this could be some of those a, a lot of the the 7500 are um you know a small brew pub in a small town but if they start making a seltzer or two and have them on tap i'm i'm counting them if okay. they're if they're one of 7500 they're going to be one of my 800 to 1500 that I'm now calling a quote unquote beverage company. So I'm just yeah. saying, um, I'm saying that at least 10%, I'd, I'd say pushing 20% will start to create products that are outside of beer. Don't just guess. to clarify too, like that, that threshold is, is simply just creating or saying have one tap. It's going to be a seltzer or something else. Yeah. Because or I think, I think one, I think one will lead to two and two will lead to three. So yeah, once I'm, I'm saying if they'll works, at least, yeah. they'll at least, uh, that many will at least start trying it. I think I definitely agree with that. Yeah. yeah, I could see the tap rooms and stuff. If it's going to be like we're going to put a soda on tap. Yeah. So then by that measure, Half Acre has been doing and they've been making the sparkling uh, seltzers or the, the flavored seltzers for, yeah. for years. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're already a beverage company then to you because they at their tap room only have uh, sparkling. Uh, I don't know why I keep saying sparkling. They have seltzers. Uh, they're, non-alcoholic They're seltzers. not at the top of my list, but sure, for this okay. kind of I just want to make guess. sure yeah. that uh, I'm, I'm understanding. Yeah. I mean, by that, I would I'd, say promotion measure. probably dictates Yeah, uh, I've never seen Half Acre company. promote that. I didn't even hear they did that until recently, but, but sure. Doing it for a long yeah. time, yeah. Right. But I've never seen them talk about it. Okay. Right. So what do you, uh, Nate, and I'm asking you as a consumer. Sure. Because I, I think of well, things I'm good a at lot it. of time. I try to think of it. Stuff as consumers sometimes is. Do you think that it does it affect your perception of a brewery if they're you know we if they're saying you know we're we're a brewery and we're a brewery because of this reason and a lot of what makes a craft brewery independent we have our label and stuff like that and I'm definitely setting you up in a certain way but I think you're already <laughs> thinking this sure. maybe not. Well, I mean, but then saying like, yeah, but we also feel just as passionate about um, alcoholic uh, seltzers. Oh, and also kombuchas and CBDs. And uh, I don't know what else you want us to make. We'll make that, too, because we feel passionate about it. Yeah. I mean, uh, as a consumer, I, I see myself as an equal opportunity enjoyer. Uh, it's, it's part of the reason why I like to go to bars and not tap rooms, because I don't want to be limited to beer. I want something that tastes good, and I don't necessarily. I'm not. I'm not. I love beer more than anything, but I'm not dyed in the wool. I mean, I drink beer, and that's it, unless it's water or something. But um, I don't know. It really comes down to the the big A word, authenticity. Mm-hmm. You know, if I were to hear that, uh, I don't know. It's tomorrow. Half Acre announces that they're going to be dipping their toes into natural wine. I think that would make a lot of sense for Half Acre. Mm-hmm. But you know. If uh, I don't know, I'm not gonna name any names. But if if, if suddenly uh, you know some some brew is like, oh, we're we really care about kombucha now, and also we have some alcohol seltzers. And like to your to, kind of to your point, if it if it doesn't feel like a natural outgrowth of their brand identity, I'm gonna be a little leery of it. But you know, I mean, I think I think. Uh, to an extent, alcoholic seltzer can be an artistic expression, just as natural wine, just as beer, just as so many other things. There you are. Um, 20%. All right. Yep. You, you heard it here. Cool. Dig it. Um, 
do you think that there's going to be one type that is the most um, successful? Do you think there's going to be like a default second type of beverage, or do you think it's going to be just like kind of scattered among a whole bunch of different stuff? No, it's definitely seltzer. Seltzer. <laughs> yeah. Alcohol. Or not. It's not a fun answer, but that's by far, yes. Yeah, That'll alcoholic seltzer. Yeah. It's, okay. it's really, uh, I don't want to offend anyone when I say this. It, it's, it might not be easy to f- get your recipe down and figure it out. Once you do, though, and you have it figured out, it's very easy to make. It's economic, yeah. Mm-hmm. Very quick. Turn it fast. You can make it. You run out. You can have more in a couple of days. It's very easy. And it turns Once out. Once you get the recipe done. I, I, the recipe can be hard. To yeah. make it taste the way you want, you, you'll dump some batches. But once you have that down to recreate the the winner, the winner, it's easy. And it turns out the kids love it right now. Yeah, the over twenty one kids don't read anything into that. Well, I'm gonna start. Stay young at heart. I'm gonna. That's right. I'm gonna look to invest in uh, fruit flavored extract companies. As soon as I'm done, I'm gonna call uh, artisanal King extracts LLC. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I take it back. I'm gonna start a company. That rebrands existing extracts and it's call an, it artisanal. If you don't have extract. the fruit contracts Lifestyle already, you're brand. too late. If you don't have yeah. the fruit contracts, yeah. You don't need it. Mine are going to be extract of extract. It's, it's going to be extract lifestyle. Yeah. Like the hop I've, contracts of 10 years ago. Yeah. I'm all about that extract life. <laughs> <laughs> um, extract is life. You're listening to WLPNLP <laughs> Chicago 1055 FM Lumpen Radio. How about you? Mr. Kirby, what's your? Uh, do you want to go, or you want me to go next? What do you want to do? You want to ha- read your written to notes? To be honest, with you, I thought we were going to dive deeper into beverage companies. Let's do it. Uh, what do you have to say? Speak up! Don't wait for me yeah, to go call off. on you. Go, man. Mike Riff. check. Mike check. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for me, my um, thought process is obviously I'm a businessman, and so and an entrepreneur at heart. And so I have my finger on the pulse of our suppliers, but then obviously it's the end user, the consumer that's purchasing our products. And it feels like there's just been a ton of, obviously we had, you know, the proliferation, the, the crazy increase in breweries, right? Um, and then we started to see the Natter Days uh, going back to Lime Marita, like, you have coffee in a can, wine in a can, wine in a box, kombuchas. All this stuff is coming out in the market. Um, and I don't necessarily have my finger on the pulse, but I can tell. You don't have to be dead to see that there's a ton of stuff going on right now. So I started to kind of rewind and just think about, well, how did we get here? What's what's taking place? Like, is it going, is it going to continue to get, I don't know, worse or, or better, depending on what you think? Um but it was uh, last night, late at night, when I was preparing for this, I just started spitballing some stuff, you know, as I do. And so I went f- as far back as, like, the 1970s when that kind of home brewing act came to be. Yeah. Right? And so that gave people the ability to essentially brew uh, beer at home and consume it. Um, I forget what it was. Irrelevant at this time. But you got more if you were married, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that kind of paved the way. Um, for like the class of '88, and there was a couple before that, but you know, class like the, of '88 being like, like some of the famous uh, old school breweries like uh, Deschutes and Deuce Deuce Island, Deuce Island yeah. right? And, yeah. Brooklyn, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think what this did was uh, largely at the time you had uh, a few breweries that were dominating the market. You know, when they were with large distributors. They had television, radio, all that was locked up, so you were just con- constantly kind of pushed to what to drink. Um, so I think it was the Goose Island of the Shoots, this class of F88, that really kind of paved the way more regionally to show alternatives to what's available. Um, and as they continued to kind of pick up, um, uh, give me the word, momentum, mm-hmm. uh, it kind of paved the way for, like, the next class. So, you know, smaller breweries were able to see kind of the, the meat on the bone, and they started to open mm-hmm. up. Um, more localized. And so I think it was through like this localization and having more alternatives that kind of led the way to kombuchas and meads, um, kind of everyone else to kind of attach onto it and, and take the chance. Um, and at the same time, though, I think you also had your large breweries doing like your Lime Maritas, starting to see like they were almost in battle mode 
uh, just kind of throwing stuff at the wall. Like, here's you want flavor? Here's flavor. It doesn't have to be natural or, or you know, uh, vegan or whatever. Yeah. But you know. And that was not that long ago. It's I mean, not at all. I mean, strawberry we were ta- we were talking lime about, was not long. We're ago. talking about you know white claw variety packs, but you know, like t- two years ago, it was lime Marita variety packs, right? Yeah. And they did very well. They did very well. They don't do as well now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's it's just uh, it's kind of a yin and yang. It's a balancing balancing act. But um, so more so to finish my point. Um, I think all of this kind of peeled the lid back on what was considered normal. Uh, you know, people aren't necessarily now like paying attention to the media, telling them what to do, what to drink, what to eat. Um, and so this kind of uh, became a catalyst for entrepreneur, entrepreneurs and producers saying, well, you know, uh, why, why not? Why not do this? And so now I, I think that's why we're seeing so many different things being put out there. Um, and like with the NAs, um, I don't think that they're – when I started – uh, in the beer business, I just I, I concentrated on people that drink beer, and then I was looking at people that were drinking spirits and drinking wine, and thinking, well, how can I get those people to drink beer? You know, and then I think at some point we started putting beer into wine barrels and beer into bourbon barrels to try and pull people from that. Um, and I think you kind of see the vice versa now, where they're putting bourbon and wine into beer barrels and yeah. that type of stuff. But um, so I think this is something that's been building up for a while. Um, but uh, I guess to to finish it out, it's it's more about uh, being able to, uh, producers and entrepreneurs being able to uh, produce a product um, for kind of a, a unique clientele or a certain um, demographic or, or locale, and they know that there's a big enough demographic where they, it'll support a business, and so they're being able to jump out there on the limb and put those things out there. But overall, I think people now are just kind of at the point where they just want to try it try you know something new even if it's just one and done like they just want to like break that mold and like show me what's out there like what's available like i want to find that one or two things that fits my unique lifestyle versus kind of being told what i'm supposed to be drinking Mm -hmm. so i think that's what we're running into right now i think that's going to continue for the next several years but um and Real quick, give me 15 more seconds and I'll stop. I'll give you much more than that if you want. So 17 I, seconds. So when I get uh, getting back to an older point, when I got into this thing and I was looking at beer and, and trying to pull from people that were drinking alcohol or wine, you know, I was really only focused on that that part of our of you know the population. And then only until recently I started thinking about the NAs, and I had an NA that, that finally tasted good, mm-hmm. and I was like, wow, like I I can drink this personally. Okay. Like this yeah. this will help me kind of simmer down um so i'm like well well here i am i've been you know looking at nothing but alcohol for so long here's this entire other population out here that aren't drinking that are looking for alternatives you know so it's like well let's start doing that and you know we we found a brewery uh that's doing a great job with it and i mean they 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 jumped into like our top five spot i mean within months and like we can't even get enough i'm you know from them like they struggle to catch up and I see a lot of uh, a lot of NAs. Not to go down a specific path, but um, but yeah, I mean they're going to explode next year and the, and the year after that. Like it's not going away. It's a, hmm. back to Doug's point. It's a real thing that's coming. So okay, sounds like a 2020 prediction. Yeah, yeah. Right. But I, but okay, and then I'm done. <laughs> no, keep but going. I don't know if we're pulling people that are like the people that are drinking NAs. I don't know if we're really pulling volume out of the the alcohol beer market or if we're tapping into or if, you know we're tapping into a bigger population that wasn't you know, involved with what we're doing, and now we're just sitting in a new demographic. Well, right. Is it the per- person who's opening that NA product, would that have been a beer otherwise, or would it have been a different NA product? Would it have been a soda or right. a seltzer or a glass of water or, or something like that? Um, yeah, it's uh, – I certainly don't know. You know, Brian, you're, you seem to be the person I would imagine <laughs> would be m- most likely <laughs> Brian to Brian with a Y. Brian with a Y, yeah. Mr. Roth. Uh, deep V. The, uh, <laughs> the deep V in numbers, that's what I'm good at. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, the, the category itself has been essentially flat for years. Um, the, actually, the, the, the only reason that it has a slight uptick this year uh, to get to Doug's point is because of Heineken 0.0, which represents – almost exclusively all of the IRI tracked growth distribution um, network 
but there it, are but some them, breweries but... like Athletic and Wellspring uh, that do a significant amount of volume um, over their website through e-commerce. So that's stuff that isn't tracked. But right now for 2019, non-alcoholic beer in terms of its percentage of the U.S. beer market and IRI grocery chain liquor stores is less than half a percent. Um, and so, and it's been somewhere between, uh, 0.32% and 0.34%, uh, for all the years leading up to 2019. So it, it's, it's small, it's very small and it hasn't changed much. Uh, I do think that broader interest is helping it grow. And, and I think the Health quality of products probably, yeah. is a big deal too. But the one thing that always fascinates me when I do listen to people talk about this segment is that it's often talked about in terms of beer drinkers choosing to start or end their night with a non-alcoholic beer, uh, of which in the American market and American beer culture I just I don't like there's no proof of that happening, uh, partially because it just hasn't been a thing. And the opportunities to have quality versions of a non-alcoholic product haven't been there. So I don't feel comfortable saying that, yeah, it's going to be a category when it's less than half a percent. The biggest markets in the world, Germany and Spain, non-alcoholic beer ranges between five and 12 percent of the beer market. Wow. Uh, But those are also completely utterly different beer cultures in the U S. Um, and so where is it pulling from? Uh, I don't think it's as easy to say, well, beer drinkers are going to choose to, to have some non-alcoholic beer and then they'll go to beer because that just opens up a whole other broader conversation about alcohol content, consumer American culture around beer and alcohol itself, which is much longer than the 50 minutes we have left in this conversation. Um, but it's promising, but I don't feel comfortable saying it's of significant matter right now. Okay. Interesting. Well, I will, I have to get to my, my story of the year before you, before DJ surge comes in and demands that I get off the mic. So we can get on the ones and twos, but for me, it was it was you know kind of a an obvious one. Um, you know, this being a, I, I I I said to myself I wasn't gonna have seltzer be any of my my predictions or stories of the year or beers of the year or anything like that. Beverages of the year, you know, um, it'll be interesting. At a uh, side note. At GABF, are they going to have um, small, medium, and large beverage company of the year rather than brewery of the year when they give out their uh, their awards? It'll be uh, let's, let's see them do that. Um, anyway, Kings and Convicts buying Ballast Point <laughs> was so mind blowing, so crazy. Just I the when I heard that, someone you know said those words, and I think I said on this show. Uh, those words in that order did not have any meaning to me. I knew Kings and Convicts was a small suburban brewery off the Metro line. Um, But the fact that they would buy Ballast Point made, it it was so, it was dumbfounding. And it still is to me dumbfounding. I know there's some information about how the, the deal was, was funded and, and stuff like that. But I think that it's a huge story. I think it's going to have huge implications outside of just that immediate brewery. Um, you know, I read an article uh, online saying that this might mark the end uh, of Constellation's foray into craft beer, mm-hmm. which I think is also uh, potentially huge. And I think it, it kind of says, says something. Uh, I think it's definitely um, a nice little uh, bookend to a certain chapter in in uh, in craft beer, and they did refute that. Who did Constellation? Mm, okay, that's cool. I mean, they still own some, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. right. yeah, they said that the, the ones that they still have are <laughs> not spread thin. They're all very locally focused, and that's where they'd 
want to still be involved in craft, but not with a national brewery that is struggles to be relevant in the Midwest. That's based in like with how they, what they got into with Ballast Point. And whose sure. fault is that? Sure. I could have told you that before they spent a billion dollars. Yeah. Right. Um, we'll, we'll see. I mean, yeah. time, time will tell. Um, you know, I mean, the day before they sold Ballast Point, they probably would have said, no, we're all in. Mm-hmm. We think it's still a national growing. I mean, that's just what you, you Sorry. say. Sorry, I rips. mean, there's certain, certain things you say. When, you're, uh, when you acquire a brewery, the first thing you say is, Nate, nothing will change, yeah. you know, and then obviously everybody knows things are going to change. So, you know, I, I think that um, also as uh, I think maybe you were, were mentioned this, Doug, that, you know, this could, uh, it might not have been you, I forget, you'll tell me, I guess, shortly, that, you know, this could have a lot of implications on, um, the valuations of other of other breweries. Yeah, I'm having a nod no and a nod yes. I, I mean, I wouldn't have said that because I don't believe that. Okay, I, I I will if I can. I I'd love to chime in about I this love, too because this is a discussion. One of the things that has always fascinated me about the 2015 purchase of Ballast Point by Constellation is that Constellation was doing this at a time when they had money burning a hole in their pocket they were going hard into their uh their business plan to chase after premium high-end brands across wine spirits as well they they got the rights to the corona modello portfolio in 2013 and their net income jumped by it was like 1.1 billion dollars Um, they were in the midst of preparing to sell off a collection of lower end wine brands for almost $800 million at the time, which ended up coming to fruition, uh, about 11 months after buying ballast point. They had a couple other spirits and wines deals as well, but they were, they had the ability to screw something up big. (laughs) They did. Um, (laughs) And it, it didn't it didn't matter. They've hit record highs of operating cash flow every year since 2015. Uh, that company is riding their import brands uh, to great success. Uh, Funky Buddha, one of their craft brands that they own, is kind of flat this year. It'll be maybe just a tiny bit up, if that at all. Uh, but their investment in Four Corners in Texas has been paying off. It's a small, relatively small brewery, but strong. Um, But I think the really important thing to keep in mind is that if there were ever a company who could just have some real serious kind of screw you money and do whatever they wanted to, uh, that was Constellation in 2015. Sure. Um, uh, Okay. I mean, they, they, they had the ability to overpay for a, a brewery. Um, you know, it, it still seems, oh, and they overpaid by a lot. Yeah. But there were a lot of (laughs) smart people in on that deal. I would hope, you know, before you start, just start laying out a a billion dollars. Well, Um, that's, that's the thing. I don't know if that was the case, uh, in conversations with people that I've had at Ballast Point, you know, the reoccurring theme has been that the, the C-suite level leadership that was then, put in charge after they let the brain trust and founders of Ballast Point go didn't know what they were doing and that it was a lot of people who were used to dealing with imports or wine and spirits who weren't familiar with the nuances or how to best handle what they had in their hands with a, a brewer like Ballast Point. So are, I don't want to take away from the idea of them being smart business people as a whole, but did they understand what the market was for American beer, you know, right now we can look back and say definitely not because they really kind of messed that one up. Mm -hmm. Um, But the the it doesn't make it any better uh, so much as it just gives context that they could do it because they wanted to. Absolutely. I meant more on the um, the acquisition side, you know, people who are kind of evaluating stuff and everyone knew that a billion dollars was insane. But it was also um, 
it got people excited, I know, at the time in the beer industry. Uh, people were like, oh, my gosh, that's insane that Ballast Point sold for that much. But, hey, who knows? Maybe in a couple of years there'll yeah. be this giant thing. And and even if they were, and people would have said, yeah, they probably could have spent less than a billion and still gotten there. But I remember at the time, and we can probably go back and, and listen to the shows, and, and people were – you know, very optimistic about um, about craft, or a lot of breweries spending a ton of money on expansion. There were a lot of people dumping a lot of money into things, or a lot of breweries opening up giant facilities, either second facilities or expansion facilities. So there were a lot of things that um, were going on, and I think Ballast Point again, was kind of a high watermark of this kind of uh, speculation. You know, that was when breweries, if you wanted a brewery, you wanted to open a brewery, you know, they would just throw money at you. They would just say, okay, you got a brewery? Yeah, okay, go. And maybe that was foolish, but I think this could have the same impact. I, I don't see why it, it wouldn't. I don't know why people would be so foolish that time, but – savvy and and know that 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 this really was uh you know isn't going to have a ramification um outside of just ballast point so i i still think i mean time will tell but i i think that this is not just a an isolated thing that is not going to have any impact in in the industry outside of uh just their immediate mm, their immediate sales i also am where do you see ballast point one year from now the, uh, 365 days from right now, where do you guys see Ballast Point? I think exact same spot. Yeah? Flat <clears throat> or or down? Uh, I think they'll be, I don't know where they're at right now, but my gut would tell me that they're going to be down. They're probably going to be down from maybe a year or two to probably really solidify where it makes sense for them to be at, almost kind of a cleanse in a sense. Mm. And then kind of, almost got to hit rock bottom and then come back up and start building it back up. I mean, uh, you know, Ballast Point was, in a sense, peaking when they were purchased. I mean, every Sculpin was the talk of the town, and then it was, here's a flavored, fruit-flavored Sculpin, and then another one, and then next thing you know, you're looking at six six-packs on a shelf. And they're all three the, months old. Yeah, all three months old or, or greater of all yeah. a different fruited Sculpin, and, like, that kind of that turns people off. And then the sale happened, and it's like, okay, well, they're taken care of or whatever. Like, let's start looking elsewhere and um, – but still, I think in my mind, great beer, great brand. It's got a place nationally and in the market. They just got to figure out where that fits and how they're going to be able to resonate with consumers and be able to capture market share. Mm. Anything else? Any other predictions for where Ballast will be? Are you going to buy any in 2020, Nate? Do you, you know what? I It's a local I, brand. <laughs> drink local. Yeah, drink local. Uh, you know, I, I really sincerely hope that uh, someone next year can say that Sculpin is the beer of the beer of 2020 but i'm i'm a little skeptical that they're gonna be able to turn it around in that much time it's a great beer uh, it was a great brand i certainly hope that uh the new ownership uh has the sense to put down the shovel and start digging or start crawling out of the hole yeah um uh, but remains to be seen early days yet all right well i think we should probably take a break listen to some music for a few minutes and then come back with uh our predictions for for next year. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, your your your, your attention, please. Your attention, please. Your attention, please. And now the moment we've been waiting for is here. Welcome back to the Beer Temple Insiders Roundtable 2019 Year End Show. Woo! Yeah, everyone yes, here go. has got their rings. Everyone here in attendance, anyway. Ron, uh, Brian, yours is uh, in the mail, and they are excited. You can you can just feel all the uh, the energy. Feel it? It's palpable. Yeah, it's palpable. Mm-hmm. So we had our our beers of the year. We've had our stories of the year. Um, and we're going to get into our 
predictions of the year. But before, I always like to just give a quick rundown of last year's predictions so we can laugh at people. And we can laugh at me first, which was my prediction was the resistance to haze. By the end of the year, oh, no. the ubiquity of haze will start to wear thin on some drinkers who may go as far as having a reactionary response against them or more likely actively look for other stuff to drink. Who will be able to scratch that itch for people? Um, and I said, also, the conversion to cans will be complete. The remaining American craft brews exclusively selling glass for six-packs will begin canning. There will obviously be some exceptions, but they will be breweries using it specifically for different differentiation a la off-color. <laughs> so... Off color has started canning this year, so even they are not an exception. So I was partially right, and one uh, for two. Eh, I, mm, I'm, I, I'm seeing the signs of of haze fatigue. That's that's just me. Any but, day now. Is that 2020 Any, or 2019? Uh, I'm saying 2019, man. But that might also be my fatigue, which started probably late 2018. Um, so uh, strong, Mike said uh, the beginning of the rise of uh, specialist breweries focused (laughs) on doing a small amount of things extremely well rather than trying to make wide portfolio of mediocre beers. Huh, interesting. Since then he has gone on to start a small brewery uh, focusing on doing certain things extremely well. Hmm, Okay. Uh, Kerry, uh, quarter crack from Deschutes, said uh, the continue uh strive uh for health and wellness will continue in our category with beers that are breaking the normal calorie carb barriers uh and of course more closings and staff reductions uh and she also said more brewed ipas she was wrong about that fern listen to what fernari said this guy i'm just gonna say killed it with his predictions health and wellness my big expectations for 2019 is that healthier better for you products will really start to grab more and more mind share things like heart seltzer uh which has already come on very strong alcohol kombucha non-alcoholic beer low calorie beer with fundamental ingredients and of course you can't talk about these trends without mentioning the role of cannabis is playing in all this it's viewed as a substitute for alcohol in some circumstances and as a product that has fewer negative repercussions on overall health. As more states legalize and as CBD beverages mainstream, cannabis edibles, blah, 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 will become more popular. I think a lot of consumers will look to moderate their alcohol consumption overall, and this will lead to the growth in some of the products I mentioned. I think he did a pretty good, pretty good job for that one. Uh, and Ed said this will be the year of the extra tap room slash brewery. Established breweries will seek to keep a hold on their market share. We'll take advantage of the new laws and open second or third locations. So I should have Ed on just so we can see what he's planning for Mars every year. <laughs> we'll just see see what he's planning. CBD coffee. CBD coffee. Oh, man. He was around. I told him if he wanted to have some hot takes. Uh, and he probably doesn't know that we're reading this. So um, we can uh, just steal his ideas. Um Okay, so here we are. It's the end of 2019, and uh, let's look into our crystal balls in the year 2000, <laughs> and uh, and see who wants to go. Um, well, should I? Who who wants to go first? Is anyone? Is anyone dying I'll, to I'll go? go? I'll go. Go. First. Yeah, get it. All right. So I I did a like uh, f- for those of you who don't know, I have a blog, and I did a predictions piece already, and I saw I have like 20 of these out there. If you want to read them, I didn't want to repeat one of those. And you also did a whole podcast of predictions, didn't you? Didn't you? Kind of. On the yeah, that pint? was a little more like this, like kind of 2019 in review type okay. of thing with uh, oh. the full pint. Mm, okay. um, but uh, I didn't want to repeat one of those. And I also like so many of those and a lot of what we're talking about is like you can it's it's a prediction, but it's already kind of happening. It's bubbling up, so of course it's going to happen because you're starting to see the press releases. You're seeing these things come out. So I didn't want to give one of those. Not trying to shame anyone who does, but I wanted to give something that's like out of left field that you might not have heard before. That's kind of random. So I'm going to combine this into two, and I'm going to say that both Bourbon County and Pliny the Elder moved to Cans in 2020. Nice. Nice. Do you feel stronger about one than the other? Do you think like this one's for sure, and if I get them both, then oh, I yeah. feel stronger about Pliny the Elder, but I, would I feel too. pretty strong about. Uh, well, the, the, 
Bourbon County is really out of left field, but I I feel like it should happen, and I think it's going to happen. But I have zero information Intel. on that. So let me, like, let me ask you about the – I think the Pliny one makes a ton of sense. I mean, those 500 – they're still doing it in 500 mil bottles, right? Yep. Yeah. It's not <laughs> it's, sold in Illinois. It's irrelevant. I mean, yeah, right. That is – insane that they are still able to move as much as they can in in that format it's mm-hmm. it's a truly special beer in in more ways than one and one of the ways being that it can still do that yeah. my um, guess is they're at the point where they need to move four at a time and yeah. not one at a time yeah and uh they have the, the brewery the to do expansion. it now yep yeah. mm-hmm. so yep. that would make sense to me i've i've never heard anyone say that so i wanted to say it cool. same with bourbon county Bourbon County now, I think, um, I totally think that they're going to be going to multi-packs very soon. I would not have been surprised if regular went to multi-packs this past year, 2019. Of bottles? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 multi-packs, just, you know, full stop, just whatever it is. I, I wouldn't have been, I, I think that's happening. And I'm guessing what you're... I'm so, also getting into the, like, lower size, so I should also have said 12-ounce cans. Yes. I'm saying Bourbon County, at least regular, will be in like a four pack of 12 ounce cans or some two pack of 12, whatever. Yeah. But cans, smaller size, wave the flag on the 16.9 ounce bottle or mm-hmm. whatever it is. Not wave the flag. Say we we did what we intended to do with that, which was extract every bit of profit we possibly could. Um, and thank you for... For being with us while we did it, we're still going to continue to do that with all the ones we hope to be able to do it. But it will come with a cardboard box that has a little clicky thing on top. So critical, you, you still get that critical packaging. You still get that um, presentation. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I th- I I was upset when it went to the large format. Same. Same. I, I wanted it to stay as four packs. I thought that was twelve one ounce of the, bottles. That works. Yeah, I thought that was one of the coolest things about that that beer was that it was unlike so many, unlike most others, it was in a format that was conducive to what was inside of it. Um, and I was hoping that they would actually have gone smaller. Nips. I wanted them to go to yeah, like man. yeah. To I would like have voted for seven yeah seven eight ounce nips. That would have been amazing. Oh yeah. So I, I I hope you're absolutely right. Cans would be very interesting. Cans, cans of Bourbon County. I feel like more places are going to cans than aren't with barrel aged beers. Would they do? Uh, I'm already thinking of the the lid and and it'll be all black. Tabs, yeah, be all, all black. black. Yeah. Well, you saw the black with maybe a gold tab. I don't know. Surly thirteen, mm-hmm. their uh, their anniversary beer this year. It is a sixteen ounce can of barrel aged stout, uh, but it comes in the uh, the nice carton. So it's a single sixteen ounce can in a a bespoke carton. Mm-hmm. Yes, looks fancy. Yeah. I'd be fine with a brown paper bag. <laughs> okay. That's kind of what I'm used to, I suppose. Yeah. So then you're gonna have people shotgunning. How long until you have shotgunning videos? You know, when, of, uh, when when we went Birmingham. to them at Rev, and so there was a good, I don't know, three, four months where we announced it before they actually came out, and that's what everybody said that they were going to do. Oh, we're going to shotgun, we're going to shotgun. And uh, I monitored our social media. I haven't seen no one. tagged in a single video of anybody. And I'm not saying nobody has, but like to not be tagged in one in three years of releasing 10 of these a year, I've not, I've yet to see one person actually do it. So. Okay. Well, but I'm sure they have. There you go. Challenge accepted. Challenge. There it is. Out there, guys. Come on. Um. Well, I like it. I like that prediction. It's it's great. I I hope it comes true. Um. If only, uh, because that would be awesome to have nailed. So. Yeah. Cool. All right. Who's next? Uh. uh go. Oh, go. Oh, all right. Go. Um. So my prediction for 2020 is that one or more uh, BA top 50 breweries are going to uh, adopt or reenact a a uh, membership or subscription model uh, specifically for uh, barrel aged beers. Uh, it looks to be that that especially larger breweries are having a harder and harder time 
uh, moving, especially American wild ales, uh, but also a lot of, you know, barely strong beers. Mm -hmm. Um, Two years ago, the Lost Abbey uh, uh, restarted their Patron Sinners Club, which uh, originally ran from 2007 to 2010. Last year, Deschutes, for the first time, uh, has created a subscription model for uh, their their barrel age program, and they're also promising uh, some, you know, like, you know, uh, stash from the cellar, what, what have you. And it would make sense that at least one more large brewery, if not multiple, will will do that in 2020. All right. Who do you think are the, the most... Uh I think right to do that. I think New Belgium would make a lot of sense. Uh, Goose Island would not. That would not be a crazy idea to create a subscription or or maybe like a single like package model around Prop Day, and then Mm -hmm. limit distribution nationally. Um, I'd love to think of what these guys places would call it, but (laughs) what they would call their little. Have you seen what New Belgium (laughs) just started this week? No. Yeah, they they just started. That is already true. They, they, they Do I actually, get points for that? They just started. No. Dire- they just started direct shipping to I think three states, which is kind of rocking some traditional thinking of what you can and yeah, can't it's, do. Uh, Nevada, um, Vermont, and DC. So you can buy their new wilds. Um, that's what they're focusing on. They're yeah. not trying to get you to ship that tire, of course, but they're focused on their their wild program with it. But yeah, it's not necessarily a direct to consumer. I don't think it's a club yet. I totally agree with you. It might be, but they've. They've cracked the code on it with at least three uh, states, if you include D.C., um, where they are now direct shipping, which is interesting. Yeah, it, it is, is interesting. really interesting. But, you know, the the, the people the, – the group of people that love these beers uh, are not nearly as, as broad as they were a couple of years ago, but they are – Certainly, as passionate, if not more so. So, you know, targeting targeting these people would make a lot of I remember sense. Everyone used to come in with your brewery Letterman jacket. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah from from my hoarder society. Yeah. Yes, you, I still have that hoodie, Brian. Yes. You you think I'm saying that in jest? In my in my memory, I don't. I want it to be true. <laughs> Nate would come in with the two tone, you know, leather leather sleeves in one color. Kind of like the wool body in another color with the big B on the back or H for Hoarder Society and yeah, and then you would uh, you also you also had a cooler. They gave you a cooler. I they remember. did give me a cooler. I used that cooler for a long time. Yeah, the the jacket uh, never existed, but I definitely had the cooler mm, for a while. Definitely existed. I remember seeing it. So <laughs> you hear it first. Yeah. Um. Very. <laughs> All right. Well, then you're. Uh, it, it, I guess it better be goose because, uh, yeah, New Belgium doesn't doesn't count. Irregardless, no. I, totally, feel, totally I feel I feel totally vindicated knowing no, what do. New Belgium's doing. You do, you do. Um, well, I'm going to jump on to that one because I think ours are are similar. Uh, you and I, Nate. I said that essentially we're going to see that breweries are going to have to jump through more hoops to maintain the hype of their, you know, whatever, you know, if they, whatever beers that they have that are kind of hype, hype driven, it's just going to be harder and harder for them to, to do. They're going to have to have a bespoke box that clicks when you open it or, you know, uh, I think it, it might even get a little gimmicky. It might get into like there's an actual piece of the, you know, the player's jersey on the card, like, you know, Upper Deck does and stuff like that, where it's, um, you know, this this just created rarity. Um, I, you know, I was joking about not joking. I was saying, you know, Goose Island could certainly do stuff like that yeah. where you, know, you have some sort of a like closed six pack and. One of them might be a gold can that's from a Pappy Twenty Three single barrel or something mm-hmm. like that, and and doing things like that. I think you're going to start seeing more of that. I also start think there's going to be, um, you know, share of uh, share of aftermarket. I would say share of throat, but we all know that these people don't really drink this stuff. They trade it for bourbon, so it's um, you know share of throat, so to speak. I think is going to start to become difficult uh, as. I personally feel as beer drinkers, um, 
drink uh, craft beer drinkers and, and people who are very much into it or, or hobbyists for lack of a better term uh, are doing this for a longer amount of time they kind of realize that this is just kind of a, an ongoing thing cyclical that, it's not even cyclical it's just like it's never ending there's always going to be something new and, and you're never satisfied and yeah. it's never going to be better it's always just going to be beer it's always going to be beer it might be different flavors but they're not going to be better they're just going to be different and i think it's going to be really hard to retain this hype and and you're going to have breweries that are going to start to you know try to find new ways to do it whether it's drop shipping in other markets you know where mm -hmm. they've never been before or you know doing stuff like that um I, I think it's going to be, by the end of this year, I think we might be coming to, uh, you know, we might have passed peak hype. Mm. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. No, certainly not. But yeah. That's, so that's my, my prediction. Who wants to go next? I'll go real quick. <laughs> so there was a so prediction said last for, time. Yes. So there was a prediction for 2019 about the <clears throat> health alternatives, the CBDs. And I think that that will continue on even more so, probably double down for 2020. I think um, – I believe we added probably two breweries last year. We added uh, two kombucha companies. We added an N.A. company, and we're at least adding one more N.A. company for next year. Um, and that's, you know, us diversifying our portfolio, but we're definitely seeing a demand uh, within the market for that type of stuff and so i don't think it's going to go away i think you're going to see more people realizing that there's a a demand and a, and, a, and a market share for it so even with that more and more people will get on board with it um so yeah so kind of more of the same and seeing a lot of crazy stuff coming out there any any predictions any specifics that you uh no nothing <laughs> specific but i think we will see uh my other point was it's me more brewery inside a brewery um, type of, not necessarily collaborations, but I think you'll see, you know, kind of in the way Hot Butcher works within Miskatonic, I think you'll see a lot more of that. I think breweries that may have scaled up uh, in tank size um, that can't meet that will be working with breweries that are smaller to fill that void. So I think, I don't, I, I would say there's going to be a downturn in the uh, purchasing of, of tank space and a more of a utilization of tank space, you know, across kind of uh, statewide or regional hmm. type of breweries where uh, it's going to be more about, okay, maybe we're not competitors. Let's find a way for us to work together and kind of like utilize, win -win utilize resources. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kind of coming together. Like yeah. a small acquisition, like a small like brewery yeah. kind yeah. of merging yeah. with another small brewery. Yeah. I want to give another, like, just more. I like your idea of <clears throat> being specific by saying, like, a dog, by saying Pliny and and Berman County. So I want to try to do more, do something very specific as well. Uh, let's see if in this year, in this coming year, we start to see, um, keeping with my prediction, these hype-driven bre breweries, if they start to kind of like form little pods where they kind of work together. Clicks. Like, yeah, little clicks. Um, but more almost like formalized clicks. Like I'll, I'll just pick a couple where it's like... Would you, you say know. that it's a 2019 store of the year about brewery team-ups? Uh, yeah, I would say that. I would <laughs> say that. Yeah, but, but it's going forward, and they're teaming up to uh, do their special releases and having kind of these semi-formal relationships um, where they each kind of do releases and stuff for each other and uh, kind of spread the... Uh, Spread the hype, mm. you know. Kind do, you, of. do you see that as like uh, being driven by geography? Like, hey, yes. you're way in the northwest suburbs, and you're like us, doing have an equally rabid fan base, but you're in the far west side. So we almost like trade release bottles out of state. I yeah. say entirely oh, out, out of across state, state lines. Okay. Yeah, I say across uh, entirely across state lines, and it might even involve people coming in and setting up like self distribution and stuff like that. Like, kind of a little bit more formalized uh, is is what I would see. Like, you know, uh, Trillium did a drop at Wakefield, and if like Wakefield then did a drop at other half, and other half did a drop at Trillium, and uh, this little like trifecta thing. If that were to happen, I'm thinking something more like that. All in kind of self distributed markets 
Just a total guess. Anyway, uh, Mr. Roth, uh, you're wearing a deep V. I saw that you had tweeted it. Love it. Dig it. Proof of life. Yeah. <laughs> so deep. It's true. You started that. That's a trend that you started among. Uh, well, I don't know if that's true. You and, uh, and um, oh, who was the other? Who Someone was the... much more attractive than me, I hope. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, definitely. Definitely. There was another beer writer who also wore deep fees. But anyway, go on. Your your prediction. <laughs> Obviously one that doesn't matter as much. Thank you very much, yes, Chris. Yes, true. I, appreciate I always that. think you and the end of your show. Synonymous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the one thing I think that Andy I Crouch, am, I am uh, happy and anxious to see in 2020, uh, I, I'm calling it the, the peak of haze. I don't entirely believe it, and I don't think I, I mean exactly what it may sound like. Um I think it's really hard to have big brands in package these days last three years without something changing. Uh, Hazy Little Thing will be entering year number three in 2020. It's wow. doubled its sales in 2019. It's, it is a huge monumental brand. It's number wow. two in stores for Sierra Nevada this year. But I, But my feeling looking at a variety of numbers is that the volume of entries – may cause something of a schism in 2020. Uh, I don't think that it will collapse. I think that the wide variety of New England and New England-inspired beers will start to hit that peak and plateau over a really long time as some breweries kind of trade between new brands. Sierra, to, Sierra Nevada is already diversifying across a hazy family of brands, too. Um, so 2021 might be the, where this really kicks in, but I think at least in 2020, that's something to watch, um, as we see year two as well for really big brands that debuted this year, like mine Hayes from Firestone Walker and, uh, official from Bell's. Hmm. So it's kind of like, uh, Clarex is coming. <clears throat> Clarity is coming. Flocculation is coming. Is, is the story of the, the great the great flocculation? Yes, the great <laughs> flocculation. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Now, do you see this trickling down to the little guys next year, no. or is this just going to be a big, big, big boy? No. It, it, it's also important to have this in context of so much goes on in tap rooms. Uh, I do not think in any way that New England or New England style beers are going away or do they have a shelf life of what they may actually help have on a shelf. Uh, but I do think that in the, at least the way that they're massively produced and sold 2020 presents itself as kind of a really important year for how breweries are going to pit themselves in a market that has more than ever. So is – will we reach the high water mark in 2020 or have we reached it in 2019? No, I think 2020 will be another high water mark easily. Uh, and I, it's one of those things where I could see it in 2021 things leveling off a little bit. Um, but at that point, too, it could be a case where, you know, Bells finds the next hazy, the next official or Fire or Firestone Walker finds the – the next version of whatever mind haze might be too. Okay. Well, I'm going to comment on this. I think that it's going to be kind of like uh, maybe, well, I'm going to say something that I actually have no actual scientific knowledge of, but like the, um, you know, did the, the dinosaurs go extinct or did they like slowly become birds or, or whatever it is? You know, are the hazies just going to, I don't think the hazies are going to go extinct, but I think they're going to very slowly kind of shift and, I, and um, that's what I think is probably more likely to to happen. But maybe stuff being called out as as hazy, I don't know. I think they're just getting started. Yep. Yeah, I don't I don't agree with any of this. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think yeah. it was just uh, it was late. That style that was like, really late to the game. Yeah, that's Discourse. playing catch up. I, I mean, I totally agree that the line culture around hazy IPAs is has peaked and uh, maybe is like uh, starting to slip down. But I, I think the the masses are just figuring out what this means still. And uh, there's if you go into uh, Jewel or uh, Mariano's, like you're only going to find three or four. You're not going to find twenty five hazy IPAs. There's not that many yet. Like they're still just getting out there. People are just learning what they are. 
and the casual consumer uh, likes them. And uh, I, I think 2020, they're just like still going up and up and up. I think Hazy Little Thing's going to keep going up and up and up for multiple more years. So uh, that's my counter. There you go. All right. The problem is I probably agree with like all of that too. (laughs) (laughs) Um, All right then. Well, any parting words that we'd like to say? We have a couple more, couple uh, minutes more. You guys, you already have your rings. You're happy. I just want to, I actually would love to give a shout out to Doug um, for the work that he's been doing recently fundraising um, for uh, Lori's Children's Hospital. Is that right, Doug? Yep. Yeah, I, I am. I'm super impressed. And as someone who follows you on Instagram, uh, I really enjoy watching the way that uh, some of the raffles that you've been doing to raise money for a really great cause has been going. So uh, kudos to you and all the great work you're doing. Thanks, Brian. Figured if it can't beat them, join them. Right. Yeah, that is great. Um, anyone out there, uh, if you're on Instagram and you scroll past the beer aficionado, you should take a look uh doug's talked to me a little bit about it and it's pretty pretty astounding in the the best way possible anyone else got anything they want to add nothing for you nate no nothing to say all right you're already putting on your bomber jacket (laughs) leatherman (laughs) i mean your uh leatherman yeah right greater shotguns on black tuesday uh (laughs) out on morgan street yeah i have 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 a thought if i have time yeah uh, this is more for anybody who works at a brewery. Advice that I'm, uh, you know, discovering. It seems obvious, but uh, I need to remind myself and remind others all the time that um, there's a lot of, you know, uh, styles out there that are getting really popular, and you feel the uh, need to to jump on. We've talked a lot about a lot of those tonight, but I just remind people to don't forget that if you are really excited about something else and you explain to your fans, your social media following, if you take the time to really engage with them and explain why you are excited for this, no matter what style of beer it is, they will get excited too. So it's okay to uh, chase a trend or two, but don't forget to do some of the things that you want to do too. And don't forget to take the time to record some video on a, on a phone and, and post it. If, if that's, it doesn't have to be anything crazy, but take the time to explain why you're jazzed about it and uh, they will get excited too so that is pretty much our whole idea for 2020 as a as a company to do the exact same thing and promote breweries who do just that so thank you guys uh see you in 2020 Radio Star Creature Vibes. Radio penetrating the airwaves. Tonight, back again with another audio edition. Star Creature Vibes. Radio here on WLPN LP Chicago. That's 105.5 on the FM dial.